So hello everybody and I'm really sorry for the delay. We had some registration problems and I think they've prevented, prevented a few people joining up. Hopefully they'll be able to join in a while but the session will also be recorded. Uh, oh, hi Leo, I'm sorry you're late, that's not a problem at all. Uh, we're only just starting ourselves. So we had a few, a few technical hitches this end. Um, so, just checking that everybody's okay with the session being recorded. Um, if you're not, could you please um, say something in the chat box? Otherwise, we'll assume that you're okay with it being it being recorded. Okay. So. I'll officially start the webinar. Um, I'm Leanne Perham, and as you can see from my name coming up on the screen, and I'm a fellow with the UK Open University's OER Research Hub, and we focus on exploring the impact of open educational resources in all areas of education. And I spent the last year conducting collaborative research with Tim Seale and Alison Buckler. They're also from the Open University in the UK. And they worked with the OER in Teacher Education Project, TESS India. And they're with me today and will be co-presenting the webinar with me. Now, the latest phase of our research with TESS India concerns OER localization, and that's our focus today, the focus of this webinar, and we've got a presentation that runs around 25 minutes-ish, and there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards, but if you do have any questions along the way, please ask them in the chat area during the presentation, and we'll either ask them, answer them as we go or pick up on them at the end, but there'll be certainly time to have some interaction. So, can I start by asking where people are from? Could you just type your country in the chat facility, just so I know where everybody, everybody is? Oh, Leo's in the UK, India from Padmini. While, while I'm watching these come in, I'd like to find a little bit more about who we're presenting to as well. So could you specify so your main um, job area or you, you may be a student, other so if you're a teacher, an academic, a researcher, or um, just your main job role, you type that in the chat box as well. Then I've got an idea of who we're talking to and then we can tailor our presentation a bit to that. Okay, so while that's going on, right, great, some more coming in there. So while that's going on, I'll get started with the presentation. So, I'd first like to set the scene a little for this presentation by referring to the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, who's got great relevance for our research, which operates obviously in the context of international development. Now, Sen states that a key aim for international development is the removal of unfreedoms which limit human beings' potential to fully participate in society. And I've put a few of those unfreedoms on the slide here. They could include poverty, limited economic opportunity, inadequate education and access to knowledge, deficient health care and oppression. And there are plenty more, but there are some really powerful unfreedoms up on the screen there. Now, the Commonwealth of Learning's three-year plan makes an explicit reference to Amartya Sen's ideas when it states that, and I've got the quote here, increasing the freedoms that men and women enjoy is a definition of development, and greater freedom empowers people to be more effective agents of development. So it's not only freedom to be, it's freedom to act, and freedom to act and to enable further development. So, how does this relate to open educational resources? Well, the project we're discussing today, that's TESS India, operates on an underlying belief that open educational resources, OER, 
can help remove unfreedoms in a development context by providing better teachers and more engaged learners, improved learners' retention, and consequently better access to knowledge. And next, I'll hand you over to Alison Buckler, and she's going to say a little bit more about the importance of OER localization in a general context. Alison. Um, thanks, Leanne. So it's a central belief of the Test India project that localization, and by localization we mean the adaptation of resources to meet the particular needs of end users. Um, it's a central belief of the project that localization is a crucial factor in removing these unfreedoms that Leanne mentioned um, that prevent people benefiting from education materials even when they're free to access. And nearly 10 years ago, David Wiley identified localization as crucial to achieving the aims of open education. Um, and you can see from the quote, he called it the future of the movement. And more recently, Tiffany Ivins claimed that localization unlocks the power of OER. Yet, localization remains absent from many OER policies at national and institutional level. And it's the, it's the belief of Tess India that without localization, um, resources produced in different cultural contexts and different country contexts can appear irrelevant and inaccessible to the end users. Therefore, even though the Tessa, Tessa India OERs were written in collaboration with Indian academics, um, the project has embedded a phase of supported localization into the OER production process to ensure that the language, the pedagogical approach, the content, um, style, imagery, and religious, cultural, geographical references, and so on, um, would speak to the experience of the teachers and the teacher educators using them in different states. So the intention is that there will be different versions of the OER for different users um, that share a consistent level of quality um, but deliver a message in a way that's locally appropriate. And it's this process of developing these different versions that we're going to talk about today. Um, so I'll hand you back to Leanne, who's going to talk about the research we've carried out that explores this process of localization as it happened in Tess India. Thanks, Alison. So I'm going to just take you through our research focus. And we cover four main areas in the research that we're presenting today. And a big overarching theme is the challenges to localizing OER for use in development education. And we'll talk quite a bit about that. We're also going to talk a bit about the impact of context and the perceptions of the people doing the localization on the whole process of localization. And staying focused on the OER localizers, we are going to look a bit at how best to support them. We found that their support needs were very dependent on the context in which they're, they're working. And we'll say uh, quite a bit about how that uh, impacts on the process. And finally, something that emerged from the research that we hadn't necessarily been anticipating from the start is the relationship between institutional quality control, so that's the people who are leading localization projects and OER projects, localized freedom, and the spirit of open. And we'll be looking at that in more detail too. So, next, to provide you with a bit of context about India's educational system, life, and forgive me if some of you um, know this already, I know we've got some um, India-based people in the webinar today, but I just wanted to give a bit, a bit of a, a scene setting about India's education system and share a few figures with you related to three problems that are addressed by Tech India, and that's a lack of teachers, poor quality of teaching, and consequently, low standards of learning amongst India's children. And just a few figures here. Um, India's education system features an enormous number of unqualified teachers and insufficient capacity to train new and existing teachers. And currently, India actually needs 1.33 million teachers. And yet, in the state of Bihar in northern India, 75 of teacher education colleges didn't do any training between 2007 to 2010. So you can see how the, the capacity is lacking in terms of training new teachers. And moving from quantity to quality, but staying with Bihar. In Bihar, 45% of teachers don't actually have the minimum qualification required to be a teacher. Um, staying with qualifications and, and testing and ranging more widely. Um, in some states in India, only 1% of 
people pass or teachers pass the teacher eligibility test that is mandatory to teach in government schools. So these um, challenges are brought together to some extent in the annual status of education report, which has been conducted by the NGO Pratam since 2005. And year on year since then, it's revealed ever falling standards in learning. And in 2013, the Deccan Herald, uh, in the newspaper, deemed the report from 2013 as a ritual exercise being the same disturbing but worsening news. So there's a clear need to um, work on improving the quality of both teachers and teaching in these um, contexts. And I'll now hand over to Tim Seal, who is Tess India's technical director, and he'll tell you a bit more about Tess India and how the project is working to address some of these um, challenges. Tim. Hi, thank you, Leanne. Yes, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on the, the project and then just go um, into a little bit about the localization process of the adaptation process that we've been working through. So uh, TESS India is an OER-based international development project at the Open University in the UK. Um, and it is uh, working with DFID funding, which was received in November 2012. And the current phase ends in May 2015. We're not working across the whole of India. Uh, we have seven focus states that we're working in um, that you can see here on the slide. And we're working across a number of subject areas um, illustrated here at both primary and secondary level. So what we've been working on is uh, a collaborative approach to content development. Uh, we're developing 125 pan-Indian study units. Um, and this is collaborative in the sense that we're working with Open University UK academics and Indian academics. And um, looking at the pedagogic approaches that, that are being brought through from the Open University and the and, and the context and educational context that comes through from the Indian academic side. But obviously, there's a lot of, of crossover in that sense. So these uh, materials, which we're calling, calling teacher development units, um, are uh, standalone, self-directed pieces of learning. And they're really about supporting teachers um, in changing their practice. Um, and as you can see, we said here that they, these, these materials suggest and inspire um, rather than being prescriptive. And they, they really do promote um, reflection in the way that we're delivering these. So this next slide just is, a, is an illustration of, of how we've sort of developed this from a, a technical point of view. So this, this st starts to go into distribution, if you like. Um, but we've used a, a structured content-based system um, that we use here at the university to allow for maximum flexibility of the materials. So we have, if you like, one input in and multiple inputs out. So from this slide, you can see in the top left, um, this is our materials presented through a, a Moodle VLE on a website. And you can see some embedded video in there. Um, below, in the bottom right, you see an example of an activity. Uh, and on the right-hand side, there's um, some tablets and mobile phones. And we have the flexibility to deliver via these more mobile platforms through um, EPUB formats. And for the lower-end mobile phones, we have a, a 3GP video output. But potentially, by far, the import, most important output is, is seen here on the left, which is a print output. Um, and that's the main uh, distribution that we're looking at at the moment. But the way we've done it allows for maximum flexibility. And you'll see why this is important from the, from the OER point of view later on. OK, so moving on really to the, the localization process, what we've done so far. Um, the first thing to note is that, that we have currently only worked on Hindi-based materials. So that's in the three Hindi-speaking states that we're working in. And of those materials, we've only worked on a, a currently worked on a subset of elementary English, elementary science, and secondary maths. So we haven't gone through the whole process yet. And this is, this is really an explanation of where we were at when we went through this process. So we started off with um, 
what we called uh, state-based orientation workshops, which were these were the kind of material review workshop where we'd work with senior um, state officials um, to really understand a little bit about OER, a little bit about what Tess India is doing, and, and to really understand what the materials are, are trying to do. So that was with, with the CERTs, the State Council for Education, Research and Training, and other senior figures in the, in the state. And these workshops were around about half a day to a day time in length. Um, we then uh, worked with a, a third party, an NGO, to take responsibility for the localization process with support from the, the Test India team. Um, and they were responsible for uh, producing the, the, the localized uh, units at the end, so they would deliver those localized, localized units. Uh, and that they employed uh, two types of people. They were state localization managers and subject localization experts. The subject localization experts uh, were responsible for the localizing or the the adapting of each individual unit, and you would have two of those people per subject per level. Um, so for for maths, elementary and, and secondary, you would have have four subject localization experts. You then have they were then responsible for employing state localization managers, and they were really responsible for the quality assurance process that came out of those materials. And you would have one localization manager per subject. So once those people were in place, we again did some more state-based uh, workshops, and these were very focused on the localization process. So what could and couldn't be done, and how how the localization process would work, and um, a little bit around what OER meant and what those materials meant in that respect. So um, they were about between two to three days long, and uh, the output of those really was looking at having a, a quite a high level draft um, uh, of, a, of a localized unit. Uh, unit. Um, and one thing just to note at the end here is there was no direct control over adaptation. And, and what I mean by that is, in other projects, we have been quite prescriptive in saying these are the areas you can and these are the areas you can't adapt. Um, that didn't exist um, explicitly in the in the um, in in the process we worked through, but through the workshops we did guide uh, localizers in understanding the the core of the materials to keep and maintain the integrity of that sort of pedagogic approach that the that the units were trying to achieve. So I'll just hand over back to um, Leanne now to take you through the next, uh, uh, sorry, to um, Alison to take you through the next section. So the, um, the Tess India project was uh, in, part in, part in, in part inspired by the success of the Tessa project, which um, is another big um, OER project at the Open University, which developed and localized teacher education materials for teachers across nine sub-Saharan African countries. In, in the bigger research study that this webinar draws on, we compared the localization process of the two projects. Um, we don't have time to go into the TESA localization in detail here because this webinar um, was written to focus specifically on the TESA India localization. But um, there are just a couple of things that I want to mention about TESA that um, are different to TESA India that helped us to um, come to the conclusions that we come to at the end. So you kind of need this as a bit of background. Um, so for the most part, the processes of localization um, in TESA and TESA India were very similar um, in that they both began with workshops in which localizers were provided with intensive support during the early stage of the process. And then these workshops were followed by independent working on the materials with support available via phone or email, which is kind of more light touch support. Um, however, there were some key differences. Um, a, a really important difference we think is that um, in while in Tess India, um, as Tim said, the um, localization experts and managers were recruited and were paid for their time working on the localization. In Tessa, the localizers were um, drawn from the uh, the colleges and the institutions that were part of the Tessa consortium, and the institutions were paid for the process. So the money was used to buy out their time. So the localizers in TESA um, were localizing as part of their institutional duties rather than as an independent consultant. Um, a second key difference is that while in TESA India, um, most of the localization um, is happening in hard copy in TESA, where 
technology allowed for this, for the most part, it was um, the localization took place digitally um, with email versions. Um, but the, the main difference, which is what this slide relates to, is that, as Tim said, the, in Test India, the, the localizers were, while they were kind of guided to keep the core um, the essence of the materials the same and the quality the same, um, they were allowed to change any aspect of the, um, <clears throat> the units that they wanted, um, whereas in Tessa, a decision was made by the consortium that only 40% of the materials would be open for adaptation. As you can see from the diagram here, the, the shaded out areas represent the 40% that was open for adaptation, and this was the same 40% for every unit in TESSA. So in every unit in TESSA, the introduction, case study one, and activity one were the same for all of the materials, whichever version um, you were looking at. Um, the, um, intention of this was that it would um, ensure the integrity and the internal consistency of the original OER, um, which um, you know, our, our, pro our aim in this research wasn't to compare the two projects, um, but just to explore the differences, um, and that was one of the key differences that we identified. Um, and so I'll now hand you back to Leanne, who's going to give you a summary of our um, more detailed research findings. Thank you, Alison. So, Summarising what we found from the research we conducted on the localization processes, um, the first two points here, which we'll have in more detail in a bit, are um, related to the same area. The challenges of managing translation and the use of the Hindi keyboard in the localization process. A further set of findings related to the localizers themselves, the people doing the localization, and a couple of challenges emerged here. First, navigating the localizers' perceptions and their experience with educators in India. And also, navigating the localizers' unfamiliarity with OER, with openness, and with online learning. And a final theme that emerged that I, I touched on already is the relationship between institutional control of the process. Alison's just been talking quite a bit about that, comparing TESA and TESA India. So the relationship between institutional control, demands of quality, the localizer's freedom, and openness. And this is going to be a theme running through the rest of the webinar. So I'll now hand you back to Alison, who's going to say something about the first two points here, translation and the use of the Hindi keyboard. Thanks, Leanne. So translation was a, a key challenge faced by the project in the localization process, um, and this challenge was kind of represented in terms of the language, technology, and pedagogic skills of those localizing the materials. Um, the test Indian materials were written collaboratively with Indian academics, but they were written in English, and the intention was that they would be translated and localized simultaneously. However, the localizer did localizers did not have the necessary translation skills, and when the translation process was outsourced to a professional translation agency, it quickly became clear that because the translators weren't education specialists, the translated versions contained some distortions of meaning. The lo that meant that the localizers had this additional challenge of not only adapting the materials, but also cross-referencing them with the original English versions to ensure the meaning of the materials was maintained. Um, and a related issue was that while it was intended that the localization would be carried out digitally, as it had been with TESSA, um, the very complex challenge of using a Hindi keyboard had not been factored in. And the majority of the localizers, therefore, were working in hard copy. And because of the other challenges of translation, it means that they were working across three separate documents often. These um, kind of unforeseen challenges uh, not only meant that the localization process took much longer than expected, but also that another layer of quality management had to be incorporated into the process. Um, so I'll pass you back to Leanne, who's going to talk about the last two research findings. Thank you, Alison. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, the need to navigate the perceptions and experience of the localizers. Um, Many of the Tess India localizers were actually subject experts who'd written textbooks for the Indian education system. And this in turn raised a number of challenges that needed to be navigated. And one of those was the fact that some of the localizers were so senior that they were actually out of touch with on the ground experiences of teachers in their states. 
And some of these subject experts also had a really negative perception of teachers. And as a result, they questioned the value of OER, suggesting that teachers wouldn't bother to use them, wouldn't adapt to um, using them. A, another big challenge was the ex-textbook writer's emphasis on subject over pedagogy. Um, this was a challenge because the Tess India resources actually emphasised pedagogy over subject. And so this needed to be navigated. And related to that was the fact that the textbook writers who were doing the localisation preferred a much more formal writing style than the informal writing style that features in the Tess India materials. So that there was a, a constant need to navigate the expertise of the localizers, which was obviously very important, but to um, familiarize them with the difference in content and style of the Tess India resources. And related to that was the localizers unfamiliarity with activity-based pedagogy. Now, this is a real focus of the Tess India materials. And as a result of this, there was a need to provide training in activity-based pedagogy within the workshop. And this slowed the process down a bit as well. Um, what I'll do next, I'll hand you over to Tim, who's going to say something about the localizer's engagement with open educational resources. OK, uh, thanks, Leanne. Um, well, this slide hasn't come through exactly how we intended. Um, but what we really were looking at was, what does this mean for OER uh, and development? So, um, you know, how does this affect your approaches to development and approaches to OER? So what we did, we took um, Joanna Wilde's OER engagement ladder, which you, you'll see at the bottom, which is a model for looking at um, characteristics of engagement with OER um, and was particularly looked at in, in HE originally um, and, and shows it as a ladder of, uh, of engagement in that sense. Um, and what we did was looked at that and then lo overlaid a, an a approaches to development in that sense. So what does it look like from a from a development perspective? Um, and we can see this manifested itself um, quite obviously in the work we were doing in localization, where um, where we looked at um, a, a sort of more directive neo-colonial approaches to development up to knowledge partnerships. Now, if we take our localizers or the users of our materials without any understanding or engagement with OER, they can see how our materials are perceived as a very directive approach to, to education. And we did have some comments back like, um, such as the, the materials being very English centric. But if you apply an understanding of OER to, across this, these materials, um, one would begin to see how you can start to move up the ladder. So you would just by having a very basic understanding, you start to move yourself away from these directive or neo-colonial approaches to development um, in terms of being understand, understanding that OER is potentially a collaborative approach to development, that the materials themselves aren't fixed within one particular period of time or one particular period of, of endpoint, so they are always constantly or available to constantly be adapted and moved up and in the quality increased. So we can see those without the engagement start at the face of the colonial approach, and that's for both developers and users. Um, and as you engage more with OER, it becomes much more implicit in the engagement with OER that you move from these neo-colonial approaches to more of a knowledge partnership, where there's a shared understanding of increase of quality and collaborative approach to, to development. So, so that's that's one area in terms of this supported approach. So, helping people to 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 engage with OER and look at development and OER as a way of using OER to increasing more collaborative approaches to to development. The other um, the the other area that that actually reflects back up on this is um, the way that you support people through engaging OER. So, we're not just talking about contextualizing or localizing the materials. But we also need to look at how we um, contextualize or localize the process by which we support people engaging with OER and engaging with that localization process. 
So you can see how within our particular concept, context where there is a, a particularly significant um, hierarchical view of knowledge ownership where you will need to adapt the process of engagement with OER to focus much more heavily at, at the bottom end, so the lower end of the ladder, so it may be that people within that situation may actually need more support and more help to get onto the first rung of the ladder, as it were, um, within, that, within that context. So we can see that there's there's the adaptation and the localization of the materials themselves, but also there's a, there's a contextualization and adaptation of the process by which we support people in doing that. And by supporting people in engaging with OER, we move from these neo-colonial approaches to these more knowledge partnership uh, approaches to, to, to development, which, um, you know, which increases these, these freedoms that we are, uh, are talking about that Leanne's going to go on to talk about a bit more now. Thanks, Tim. So I'm going to start concluding the, um, our part of the webinar by sharing an emergent model for conceptualizing the relationship between institutional control of the localization process in the interests of quality and between the localizer's subsequent freedom and the level of openness in the localization process. Now, um, open educational resources um, are embedded within the open education movement, which in turn values the idea of openness and freedom to adapt and reuse content. And we are interested to see what factors made that possible and whether indeed it was realistic in the context of localizing OER for use in um, India's education system. So we have a comparison here on this slide between TESS India, represented in red, and TESSA, which Alison mentioned earlier, represented in orange. And I should stress here that this isn't a quantitative representation. So the numbers on there don't represent an amount of anything, but just the direction of travel, more, more or less. So as you've heard already from Tim, the TESS India localization process, which is a two-tier process, featured quite a directive initial phase of resource adaptation. And this is intended to offer a way of ensuring that the changes that are needed to meet local needs actually do take place during the production process. And also allowing for further localization by teachers and teacher educators once they're brought in for the resources used in their own practice, so in the classroom. Now, here, you can see for Tess India, represented in, in red, there's a moderate level of institutional control. And I'll just refer to there, moderate level of institutional control, quite a lot of freedom given to the localizers themselves. But in fact, the localizers were quite reluctant to make much change to the materials. Um, so the level of openness was also quite moderate, despite their local having quite a bit of freedom. And here, this is a quote from the academic manager of Tess India, who said that, that she'd like to see more from the state people, the localizers. And she gave a couple of examples here. If they wanted to see more assessment done in the classroom, they could have adapted the resources to reflect that. Or if they wanted to see more attention paid to yet low achievers, they could have adapted the resources to um, incorporate that as well. Um, this um, academic manager concludes by saying that she'd like more radical localization rather than safe localization. But highlights an interesting um, aspect, really, that there's a deference, a deference to expertise, a deference to experts that gets in the way and leads to people's reluctance to, to adapt. So comparing Tess India with the TESA OER project in sub-Saharan Africa, where, as Alison has said already, there was quite a high level of control. And this actually resulted in a more restricted element of freedom for the localizers. There was actually quite a high level of openness as a result, where quite a lot of changes were made by the localizers to the TESA resources, adapting them to their own contexts and, and settings. 
So here it looks like that the restrictions by an institution that control the initial parts of the process can actually lead to a higher level of openness and the localizers being a full partner in the process. Now, I'm going to hand you back to Alison as we near the end of our part of the webinar. He'll say a bit more about this idea of knowledge partnerships. Alison. Thanks, Dan. So this is um this diagram represents our emerging framework of OER development as a knowledge partnership. Um, and as Ian just said, our research highlights an interesting dynamic between quality control on behalf of the institutional leaders of OER projects, the freedom of the localizers, and the ultimate openness and quality and relevance of the OER. And we've tried to um, illustrate this through this diagram, which shows some of the factors affecting the localization process and the factors that contribute more towards the knowledge partnership approach. And you'll see um, that, as we've talked about, um, it does include an amount of institutional top-down control. Um, this is an emerging model, and we're aware that it might be considered to counter the spirit of open in its kind of truest sense. but we think that these are important issues to debate if OER is to be both equitable and sustainable. Um, and we suggest that it's not only the end product of an OER that needs to be contextualized and localized, but also the frameworks and the processes that lead to and support its contextualization. And we think that until these issues are, are more talked about and more researched and kind of thought about in OER, then um, it's not going to be the true knowledge partnership that is, is obviously the ideal for um, the movement. Um, now I'm going to hand you back to Leanne for the last time who's just going to conclude our presentation. Thanks, Alison. So I hope that um, for the people here, our presentation has, has raised some issues regarding OER localization in all contexts, not only in international development. And we'd be really happy to answer any questions or to pick up any um, I don't know if any points have been made in the chat, but certainly to answer any questions or clarify anything. Um, so really, over to you. Anybody, any comments, questions on this? Um, if anyone would like to ask a question uh, uh, verbally, um, if you just raise your hand, I'll... Um, I'll um, I'll give uh, give you permission on the on the microphone if that makes it any easier. So Padmini has asked in the chat how okay how do localizers understand localization whether it's as translation or adaptation. Um, I don't know, two of you wanted to pick up on that. Yep. So um, one thing I think I may have just omitted from the presentation was that. Um, the the materials were translated into Hindi um, um, before the workshops. So when the uh, localizers had these materials, they were already in Hindi. Um, so so I think that was that helped to base that in an understanding of adaptation. But as was highlighted, there were some issues around the translation that we had. Um, so I think it'd be fair to say there were some issues around. Um, people making the translation better, but that wasn't the intention. It was a, it was an unintended outcome, if you like. Um, and, the, and probably just following on with the degree of freedom um, accorded to localization um, experts, I mean, essentially that the QA managers would be ensuring that the pedagogic approach was maintained through those materials. So there wasn't any hard and fast, don't change this, don't change that. But it would be key to ensure that the, the approach maintained the same. 
So in that respect, there's an understanding that actually it's the it's the examples that are more likely to be able to be changed and the way that we present these examples rather than actually the, the core approach to the teaching in that sense. So I hope that, that answers that question. And can I just add something there? The, um, the degree of freedom that they were given um, was much greater than the degree of freedom they took advantage of um, and from our interviews with the um, those managing the localization process um, the, the, the feeling was that their localizers the SLEs had played it very safe and they hadn't made as many changes as um, as was maybe expected or, or hoped um, um, but you know that's that's down to lots of factors, including the you know the introduction that they were given and the guidance that they were given, um, and and the the feelings of the of those coordinating the process was that they would have liked to have seen a more kind of radical um, localization, for example, um, that was more in line with the the state curricula or the state policies um, from where they where they were from, uh, but that that wasn't evident at this stage. So. Um Shaman is asking here, what if localization is done first and then do translation? Uh, do Alison, Tim, do either of you have a view on that? Um, I know that with Tessa, that's the order that it happened in, um, and it came with its own challenges. Um, and again, this was again this was unexpected for Tessa. They had to introduce another layer of quality control within a, with someone. A special education specialist reading it after the translation because the translators again weren't education specialists and there were several um, just just small words and phrases that were actually quite significant that were changed in the translation that then changed the whole meaning of the the activity. Um, uh, so either, whichever way around you do it, you have to it has to be checked back to ensure that the quality is consistent. I think. Yeah, and I think that's that's the, the the key point. I mean, in if you like, if we we say that there has to be this level of institutional control, then it helps a lot if the language of localization ad and adaptation is one that the institutional control, if you like, can engage with. Um, so, um, as Alison said in Tessa, it was in English, but it brings in this whole other load of it, a lot of issues. Um, you could see how potentially if we conducted the our localization process in English that when because of the issues we've had with translation there's potential there to um, maybe lose the meaning that we originally started with um, so I think um, I think there are pros and cons for each <laughs> um, if you're looking at institutional control then I think um, and therefore possibly a more richer where we are then we're doing it in the language of that institution who is running that QA is the, is the key part to that, I'd say. So just looking down in the chat box again, um, right, so Leo is saying that uh, he's acknowledging the complexity of OER adaptation and suggesting that in the context of a project, adaptation becomes more achievable than it is for someone working on their own. And I think, yes, there is some, some truth in that that um, the ability to um, run localization workshops, to have a team of people doing localization um, when you're a project is, is, is much more realistic than an individual creating a resource and hoping that it will be used in lots of different contexts. Managing the process is, is, is more of a challenge. I don't know if um, Tim or Allison had anything more to say on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an yeah, interesting, interesting point, and I think we see, you know, in terms of the OER community and the, and the, the rhetoric in terms of, well, adaptation happens every day in many different places, I mean, and particularly in primary schools where there is a lot of sharing and a lot of adaptation of content, and that is done very singularly on people on their own. Now, it may not be OER in the sense that we understand it in terms of license agreements and and, and then resharing things out, but it does happen, and it does happen individually. Um, so I think there's a really powerful argument to, to say that 
um, for that individual context. If you're an individual educator working with an individual class, um, the power of that um, adaptation works much better on an individual scale. Um, but when you're trying to maybe adapt it for a wider audience, like we are at the moment, so within a whole state, yes, I mean, that project focus is much, much more important. But I would hope that then, you know, when when people have the skill sets to do these things, that actually individuals would be adapting them down to their particular individual needs. So I think, does that, does that help to answer that question, Leo? I'm sure. Thanks, Tim. I was just, um, Leo might come back on that in, in a minute, but I was just picking up on um, Padmini, who I'm seeing here is involved, was involved in the development of testing at Lucknow, and um, mentions the difference that the teachers, the end users, were very apologetic about making any observations on the TDUs that didn't match the author's perspectives. And there's a, there's a tug of war in localization between displaying, displaying content knowledge and on the one hand and literal translation on the other and understanding what adaptation entails. So yeah, that's sort of providing, I think, further evidence for, for what we found in this research. I think as well, in, in relation to that, um, um, for, for a separate research project I've been doing, I was interviewing um, someone who was involved in writing the original materials um, for Test India, and she was talking, um, she's a teacher educator in India, and she was talking about how teachers tend to think that whatever's written in the textbook is, is, is I'm doing quotation marks, is the truth. Um, and that that's a massive shift in people's thinking, a way you know, to get them to think differently around that and that you know, what's written in text, textbooks isn't the truth, it's just a version of, it's just a way of presenting knowledge and giving teachers the kind of the, the skills and the kind of freedom to, to think differently about that and that they can change that is, 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 you know, is one of the end goals of the project, but it's, it's it's not a simple task to say, you know, to change someone's world view <laughs> and then ask them to just get on with doing it. And so that deference is really kind of deep seated, I think. And, and it isn't just you know, necessarily an Indian thing, but it's, it's common everywhere in the world. Thanks, Alison. Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments or, or experiences they'd like to share? As Tim said earlier, we've, um, I think we've turned on the mic permissions. If any of you want to use the mic or either that or use the um, chat facility as well. Yeah, if you just raise your hand if you want to use the microphone, I'll enable it. So there, there will be, uh, so Suman, yeah, uh, we're going to have another session. So there will be a number of other webinars that um, we're running uh, as part of TESS India. And I believe, um, Leanne, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's still a number of uh, webinar sessions um, being run by the OER Research Hub as well, um, uh, separately, not specifically on TESS India all the way through. But I would hope that we would have another one as, as this, uh, as the localization process adapts and moves forward. And there's certainly some um, different models that we're currently looking at now to adaptation. So uh, we certainly will build on on this presentation with those uh, uh, as those as those um, processes are implemented. Yeah, just confirm everything that Tim said. The um, OER Research Hub has um, webinars planned for the future. You can go to the OER Research Hub website for that. And also, um, we will be doing another webinar a bit later in the year. So I'm saying please share webinars. Um, yes, one way, there's various ways that you can find out when other webinars are happening. We promote them via Twitter and on the Test India website and on the OER Research Hub website as well. And if you if you go to our website and can sign up for um, a newsletter, uh, which is quarterly, we will also send you out information on um, when we have the, the latest webinars and, and other things that are happening. And oh, um, 
Yes, so Leo, uh, about publishing, we do have um, uh, we do have two publications um, potentially coming out at the moment um, in Open Praxis and in uh, and another uh, publication, Jime. So we're hoping that those will be published. Um, if not, um, there will be papers that we will circulate more widely um, after this. Okay, so I, I think that um, we'll bring this webinar to a close. And thank you ever so much for attending. And do do contact us if you want any more information. Visit the website, and we will hold uh, another webinar in the future. But it's been great to, to have you participating in this one. Thank you, and thanks to Alison and Tim for co-presenting with me. Thank you, and do feel free to get in touch via the, the details on the on the screen.